Welcome to episode 514 of the Man That Can Project podcast. I'm your host, Lachlan Stewart. Very, very excited. This will probably be one of my last recorded episodes in Australia for the time being. And who better to have on the show than G Unit, Mr. Gardell, Samuel Gardell. Mate, you've been on the show a number of times. I've actually got it written down here on my notes section before you have a little look. Episode 207, we spoke about creating a healthy workplace. Episode 287, where we spoke about balancing business, family, and health. That was 2020 for the first one. 2021, we missed last year because you're just too hard to get. Oh, come along. And, and 2023, we're back on. <laughs> mate, stoked to be here. It's good to have you back, mate. But um, I'm very fortunate to call you a good mate. We get to talk about a lot of stuff a lot of the times. You've helped me with a lot of challenges over the over the time and one thing I want to highlight about you just for people on the show people generally listen to this show because they want to improve an area of health wealth or relationships and one of the things that I've got to give you credit for which I probably haven't done before and I'll just do it in front of thousands of people now is your ability to be a good mate or actually just being a good mate we went on a trip to Midge Point which was amazing you teed it up for all the boys and treated us which was amazing but your the effort you put into a mateship you just call people not many people in my life call me just to check in so people call me when they want something but to have someone that calls you to check in that's when you're like that's a fucking awesome mateship the added benefit is is you're an incredible businessman you're an incredible father and husband so there's so much I want to dive into and we've covered stuff in earlier episodes but I believe I'm also a better interviewer now (laughs) and I think you're also better at articulating how you've created stuff in your life um so here we are at the Gardell pad. We want to cover things around how you've doubled your business year upon year over the last four years, which is incredible. And the amazing thing about that is you haven't just thrown the cash straight back in your back pocket. You've reinvested in staff, uh, infrastructure, systems to be able to create a bigger picture, which is probably where we can start. Yeah, that's right, Lucky. So... What I find in a lot of trade-based businesses or any businesses really is that generally there's a profiteer or the owner of the business who's generally fairly focused on on the net profit and, and putting money in their pocket, which obviously is a important part of having a business because it's no good if you're not making money out of it. Um, however, I've over the last couple of years, I've really focused on future-proofing my business by putting people in place that, um, you know, they might they might cost a bit more than someone else I could get to do a similar role, but I've really targeted trying to get the people that I want in the business because it all has a knock-on effect back through to my personal life um, by having people that can, you know, grab a good hold of their role and um, complete it to a high standard means that I'm not checking everything, I've got more time, um, I don't have to be here all the time, I can, you know, get out and do do the things I want to do and one of the first things I think I, I wrote down uh, back in 2020 when we did the breakthrough experience was I wanted to go to my kids' sports carnivals and that's just like a simple thing, it, it it's just something that I use as a bit of a compass for me, so if I'm so involved in my business that I can't run away for three hours and you know go watch Maddie's athletics carnival then I'm not doing something right um and I always said to myself I don't I don't want to be an oversized um you know uh sole what is it what's it called trader yeah I don't want to be an oversized sole trader it's no point calling yourself a company (coughs) when you're basically one person so that's what I've really been focusing on is getting the business to a point where um, there's, you know, enough people involved and enough people doing the jobs that I don't have to be here all the time. How have you gotten to that point though? So I understand, you know, back in 2020, for example, you made the decision that you wanted to be able to go to Maddie Sports Days and now I'm sure Louis Sports Days as well. And that's a decision I'm sure a lot of people make that. That's why most people probably start a business because they have the idea of, the potential freedom that it can create or the wealth that can create with that. However, along the way, you become so ingrained. 
And I think one of the biggest challenges is people go, I'll do X when I achieve Y, meaning I'll go start going to my kids' um, sports carnivals when I turn over X amount of money. Yet yeah. the challenge with that is once you're turning over X amount, and if you haven't already implemented the routines, it's harder to do because the responsibility is bigger or the consequences of stuffing it up are bigger. So how did you – and what was your mindset like in order to just be able to go, okay, well – I'm going to grow, but I'm going to reinvest in my... Because it must have been tempting, right, to take the profit for you instead of putting it back into the business, was it? Um, no, not particularly. Oh. It's uh, it's probably one of the vices I don't have is that I'm not particularly money-driven or money-hungry. Um, and I think I've got fairly good foresight in seeing that if you keep operating at 100% of your effort into the business and you're going to lose in other areas of your life and... Back in 2020 when we first met, it was very much me and five or six other people and I was working my ass off um, and that was that was somewhat out of necessity at that point in time. But at that time, I also started to get my head above water and I knew that if I kept doing what I was doing, I would, I'd be making good money, but I was going to blow myself up. So that's when I started... Um, pretty heavily investing in in coaching, um, reading, podcasting, um, and just starting to really grow up, I suppose. <laughs> um, and, yeah, and even even lately, I think we've been speaking a bit about, you know, getting my – me and Samantha have got our, our will and our power of attorneys and all that sort of stuff sorted. And I'm 35. I don't anticipate on dying tomorrow. <laughs> but Hopefully not, touch wood. It's – just something that is is done now and it's been an expensive process it's been a painful process but it kind of gives me like more of a drive to um to keep keep going with how I'm going and more of a um I know it just feels like warm that I've got my life partner we've got our you know our trust set up for our kids we've got all our super stuff sorted out we've got our life insurance done and it's just like all right we've got all this good foundation that's cost a lot to set up and do but now we're good for the rest of our lives pretty much and obviously it's going to need a tweak here and there but we can now just really focus on on living and making sure that if anything ever did happen to either of us that we'd we'd be looked after basically why do you feel that took you so long then to get the will and those other things in place? Like 35 to me still seems very young. However, there's probably some people who are listening who are 50 and still don't have that in order. And some who aren't even, you know, myself, I didn't even think about it until you were speaking about it. Amy's always said it. I'm like, nah, she'd be right, mate. Yeah, look, I didn't really think about it till I um, met a financial planner that I've been speaking to. And um, he he was just... Uh, going over over some financial stuff that I had, and I was I was looking to purchase uh, this shed, which which my business resides in that we're leasing at the moment. But um, I've just got a, a contract on it, and congratulations, and everything that's approved solid. to buy it. So that's just another thing of having, yeah, just feeling really grounded in where I am. Like my house is three hundred meters from my business, my kids' daycares, you know. 500 metres away, Maddie's school's two kilometres away and just having that nice um, sort of home base is what I I need in my life. I'm yep. not definitely not a nomadic operator and yep. I know that. So, um, yeah, having having all that sort of set up has been a good, good weight off my shoulders and now it feels like I can just really um, get into my work but... I'm not running anywhere real fast, like where the business is going well, but I don't want to just go nuts for three years and then call it a day. I want to s- sort of create a a company that's going to stand the test of time and um, be a great vehicle for lots of apprentices to come through, training them into being future um, leaders within the business. And then also my, my staff get to call this place home and um and that's why i put so much money into making this office and this space how it is because i believe 
that if you've got yeah happy happy staff and they're they're going to be much more productive and um that can only lead to good things within the business definitely for for you to develop that was there any has there been any standout moments and i want to come back to why you started heavily investing in coaching and what things you were specifically looking for but before we hit that why do you believe or what was one of those moments that stood out for you that made you recognize you couldn't just try and get the most or the cheapest employee to get a job done because that's what a lot of people are doing they're trying to cut costs down on employing people and still want them to perform at a high high standard for you you pay well but you also somehow well there's probably not a somehow you'll explain explain that but you get the best out of people yeah how have you developed that and I guess why did you recognize that was needed I think I recognise that having a high staff turnover is a killer um, and I've seen, yeah, throughout my time in, in a trade-based business, I've seen a lot of um, tradesmen just being paid extremely poorly by their employer and generally they're the ones that I end up interviewing because <laughs> they're looking for greener grass yep. um, and I just, you know, there's... Bosses that'll squabble over five minutes on a on a timesheet, and they'll be you know yelling at employees for using tolls, or they'll be up <laughs> up them for you know a slight productivity drop or something like that. And like people don't go to work, um, you know, to be treated like they're in prison. So I try to give all my employees a lot of freedom, and I think they reciprocate by giving me a lot of productivity. So um, you know, whenever people feel caged up, they're never going to perform. Yep. Yeah, people like to feel like they're in control. Have you had a, a moment where pe- someone has taken advantage of that? Yeah, so I believe I'm a pretty good judge of character usually, but I have had a few um, employees take advantage of my easygoing sort of <laughs> nature and how I try and run my business and look, you're going to get that out of every 20 people you might get one bad egg um, and probably in hindsight I could listen to a few other people that may may get um, some some idea that someone may not be doing the right thing mm-hmm. um, and you know moving them out of the business pretty quickly but yeah I have had to cases over the last six years I oh, know longer than that probably over the last 10 years where I've had employees stealing from the business and it's just the most horrible feeling when I'm so I feel like I'm so kind and welcoming to everyone and then when someone shits on you it's like yeah it it hurts how did that go down when you noticed that they were stealing from you like what was it because do you enjoy the tough conversations like that or how did you navigate the whole pulling someone up on that and yeah getting. like those conversations I don't mind having and <laughs> keeping your emotions in check in that point in time is isn't the easiest either but um yeah look it's a it's it's happened now and I actually processed it and and threw it out pretty quickly and just moved on because I realized that harping on that isn't going to be isn't going to help me moving forward and then I just had to put better people and better systems in place and that's where it comes to employing the right people because if you yeah just always do what you've always done you'll always get same bloody <laughs> results same result. so um yeah just employing some people that were a bit better at um the detail side of things and process is has been the biggest catalyst to my growth and being able to do it um sustainably without it being a you know two years of blasting and then and then nothing yep. so what do you look for in people what do you what do you believe makes a good employee or even still a good person because i know you look at people before obviously skill sets are important but there's some things behind the skill set that are important to you in your company culture what would be some of those traits or characteristics yeah i don't really even read cvs to be honest i just usually like obviously then you need to know if you're employing an electrician that they've got an electrical <laughs> yeah. license but um have me showing up one day yeah generally just try and um i don't know try and get a bit of a, a feel about the person just by talking to them and 
ask them what they got up to on the weekend. Yep. Um, and, you know, I one of the things I definitely look for in my field staff is um, seeing if they've played team sport somewhere in their life. Um, because in my experience, anyone who's played team sport is generally a pretty good employee. Yep. Um, and the way our work happens is that it's pretty much always in a crew, um, usually minimum of two people, maximum sometimes on large commercial jobs, there might be 13 or 14 people on one job. Um, and if you got one guy that's all about himself, they get found out very quickly and the boys are pretty quick to let me know that someone's not a, not a team player. So I try and, um, yeah, filter that out before it gets to that point. A lot of people use that same process where they look for people who have done team sports because you can obviously find understand your role in delivering a specific outcome. You don't need to be the jack of all trades, master of none, which is I've been guilty of and I think a lot of business owners are as well. As you were saying at the beginning, you need to find a way to sort of filter yourself out if you ever want to actually have the freedom that a business can provide you. Yeah. How did you learn to let go of responsibility? Because obviously that's part of the process of weaning yourself out. Yeah, I probably started by getting rid of the things that I didn't enjoy doing first. So um, Straight off the tools, mate. <laughs> no, nah, well, I actually like being on the tools, but I can't um, I can't at this point in time. But yeah, I am hopefully building towards a point where I can sort of pick and choose how much I want to do yep. on the tools and how much I want to do in the office. Because um, at the end of the day, I don't want to lose my lose my skill set of, of being an electrician. Um, but, yeah, I've lost my train of thought there. Where That's all right. We were going back to, um, we spoke about skill sets, then we were looking at, uh, I can't even remember. Let's oh, see. so, yeah, <laughs> so getting, yeah. I was just the, thinking the about let go you getting was, soft hands like me. <laughs> the way I let go was by probably removing some of the things that I didn't enjoy doing, first of all. So that was, um, yeah, bookkeeping. And then by getting rid of that, that sort of showed me that I had heaps of gaps in what I was doing and just simple things like not using systems properly and not creating purchase orders and then getting to the end of a job and wondering where half the materials are and you know looking under the seat of your car for an invoice from the wholesaler or something like that. And that's what I knew I wasn't good at. Um, I don't, yeah, I really don't have a process driven yep. brain so I employ people that do um, and they yeah they rouse on me all the time because I probably step outside the procedures from yep. from time to time but um, yeah that that was probably how I started to let go and when you um, see other people doing something way better than you could have ever done it that's that that's probably the trigger of being able to really just go, all right, I'm not good at that, so yep. I'll get someone else to do it. So you still even, do you give your staff or management team and stuff permission to rouse on you if you're doing stuff wrong as well? Yeah, definitely. I, I often don't ask sit above for, them, yeah. Ask, yeah, I often ask for feedback and it is it is a, a, a positive thing that we've got a very flat line structure within my business, but yep. um, it can also be a bit of a, a negative thing sometimes um so it's just managing yeah managing that structure and yeah making it still feel like a team and I definitely don't talk down from the the top um I try and talk across to everyone and um yeah we we work on things together why is feedback so important yeah, well, when you've been your own boss for 12 years, um, there's not too many people telling you what to do and what you're doing well and what you're not doing well. So, I yeah, I often ask some of my staff what I can be doing better for them. Um, yep. I also find it's a good gateway to some good conversations because at the end of the day, I'm still a... I don't see it, but I'm a 115 kilo bloke that's you know ex rugby league front row so people might see me as intimidating but I don't think I'm intimidating and this is something that um Sean and I've worked on a lot where <coughs> I need to open the open the conversations because people generally aren't going to open the conversation with me because they may be intimidated even though 
I don't see myself as intimidating at all. Yep. So um, by yeah, opening some conversations and and asking for feedback on myself first um, generally opens up the communication channel, and then we can get into some good stuff. So. That's a whole thing around judging a book by its cover as well. Like if people see you as intimidating, they're still missing out on the opportunity to engage in all the stuff that you know. And I, I'm a big believer that everyone's an expert in something that you're not, regardless of what they look like. Some of the toughest people I've ever seen end up being some of the most incredible people. Yeah. But they're just, you know, there's always that barrier, but it's like, what do you got to lose? If they tell you to piss off, they tell you to piss off. That was one of the best skills I developed when I was Brisbane's best Uber driver, was learning to build with people, uh, rapport with people from all walks of life. Just like, what can I learn about this individual? Yeah. Um, and it's one of the exercises that we do in the academy about every six months where we give that feedback form to uh, pass out to people in different areas of your life. So probably someone from a friendship circle or a work colleague and you know a different area, like a social group. Yeah. <coughs> where you can get feedback on how you're showing up because quite often we think we're showing up in a certain way and it may be very different to you know, how your wife thinks you're showing up or how your you know, colleagues think you're showing up. So it's always good to get that feedback and sometimes it's hard to digest. However, if you look at it from the place of improvement, it's very beneficial. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I do recall one of those um, feedback pieces we've done within the academy and um, I think I wrote... A, I think I wrote a message to Wes Vassil yep. at that time and just thanked him for being such a kind and, um, you know, welcoming person and I, I really aspire to be like him in some yep. ways. Yep. So, um, and that was probably when we weren't even really good mates at that point in time, yep. but I think just by giving him that feedback, it it made us closer. Yeah. And now we chat like a couple of times a week for yep. half an hour in the morning after gym, yep. and like he's a he's a wealth of knowledge, and I think he gets a bit from me as well, and we have some great chats. So, yeah, that's the power of community, though. Like if you're around the right people, like you and I literally have awesome chats all the time. Sometimes you give me a bit of feedback that I don't want to hear, and uh, you know, it's welcome but it also helps me improve. And I think when you've got the right people in your life, whether it's from, you know, an acquaintance, someone that you might pay as a coach or you've just generally got mates who are interested in helping you become the best version of yourself, that's how yeah. you fast track because they're generally on the same wavelength. It's when you talk to people that, you know, have no idea any about things that you're interested in, you don't get that that yeah. energetic conversation. So you're just like, all right, that was great. But yeah. then when you, you you and I bounce off heaps of crap, where's say, there's so many blokes that you can have those conversations and you walk away with a little nugget that you're like, thank goodness I had that convo. Yeah, like and leveraging on your network as well. Like people, people are always happy to help help people if they know that their heart's in the right place. Mm. Like if someone's coming to you and wants to chat to you but all they're chatting to you about is they just want to basically replicate what you're doing, <laughs> then you can sense that and it just it, you're not really going to be real open to a chat with them. But I think I told you about oh, two months ago I reached out to a couple of guys that I'd played golf with a little bit um, at Brisbane Golf Club. They're both in their early 60s. Yep. They're both successful business guys. Um and I caught up with them for, for breakfast one morning and it was like an hour and a half and it felt like I was being interviewed by the police for an <laughs> hour and a half. But yep. they were getting into some really, really good questions and I was like, I was backpedalling a bit because I had one I one thought and one idea of what I was doing and then once they started <coughs> drilling into me, um, like, yeah, I found it super beneficial but... Then the feedback I got from them was that they were super impressed with how I manage staff and how I view staff and stuff yep. like that. And these guys are in their 60s and they've had multiple businesses each and they learned something from me Yep. and I learned a heap from them. No money exchanged hands and we just had a coffee and it was like one of the best hour and a half so I've, I've spent with people. Um, and I think having yeah having a coach is very similar to that where 
if if you've got someone who can just listen and ask the right questions of you, mm. they don't need to know jack shit about electrical contracting businesses. All they need to do is know how to get underneath the surface level of what you think you want. Yep. Yeah, it is that simple. I had a guy yesterday I was on the phone with which ended up that same sort of experience. He just interrogated the hell out of me. Yeah. And he's down in Dubbo, very successful dude. And at the time I was like, fucking hell, this is like, do you not follow my socials or listen to the podcast? I talk about this stuff all the time. But then he's like, oh, I'm sorry if I'm interrogating you. I just want to know. And I was then when I got off the call, I went through, I've got notes here around all the stuff that he asked me that I hadn't really thought about how I would answer that question. So I took yeah. away so much from that because I'm like, fuck, I don't actually ever speak about that in anything that I do or ever put that point across. So he's given me so much more to think about on how I can you know, answer questions better for people. And that's, that's the cool thing about being around people who are almost like a whole have different experiences to you because they yeah. just unlock this whole new area that you're like, fuck, now I need to think about that. Yeah. It's, you know, even for for you, for me, it's like, okay, you're in a position where you could step back like you, and you've done this through things that we, a couple of things that we've talked, spoken about. It's like, yeah, you're growing your business, but you're heavily reinvesting back in the business because you understand that where your goal is, is 10 down, 10 years down the track. It's not about tomorrow. Yes. And a lot of people are very impatient. They want it yesterday. But thing, good things take time to build. Because as you found out, even um, you said to me last week, um, you're like, Fuck, I'm very busy at the moment because the staff members away. And you're like, it's just now highlighted a crack that we need to work on improving. Yeah. And that you can't just guess or like, I'm sure you didn't even think about that until it happened. Yeah, no, I never, I never really considered it. And I... Like I told you, I ended up with two vital people on leave at the same time and I worked out that I'm the only person that could fill one of the roles. Um, and then, yeah, Tash and I, my general manager, together had to cover the other role. So I was doing basically two and a half jobs for two weeks and I was doing two jobs for the two weeks prior to that. So... <laughs> I, I just found a, a massive gap that I never even saw coming. So out of that, I've learnt two things. This, these two guys will never be going on leave at the same time again. So um, boys. <laughs> yeah. And the, the other thing that I learnt from it is that we need to cross-train a couple of other people within the business um, that can assist with covering for mm. those those guys when they are away. So, yep. like, always always learning, so... And you can't teach that until you're going through it. Like one of the, I was thinking about this this morning because this gentleman's like, what are all your credentials? What are you studied? And I used to be very focused on saying, because I am studying psychology and, you know, I've done all these other things for what I think about. But it's like the stuff that I'm studying has nothing to do with what I focus on anymore. Specifically when the man that can started, it was really heavily mental health focused. Yeah, That got too much for me to handle and it wasn't really where I wanted to, you can see how much pain you're in with the neck, mate. I feel sorry for you. For those who didn't see the Instagram story, guard dog, what do you got? What's it? Uh, Rye neck. W-R-Y. It's like neck spasms. Not enjoyable. So if you're watching YouTube and he looks uncomfortable, that's why. (laughs) (laughs) Poor bastard. Um, But yeah, it got me thinking, it's like the stuff that I focus on is helping people perform better. And that's like looking at health, wealth relationships, but more habit-based time management and accountability. Their skill sets. You can't, you know, you can talk about that. But when I, I remember when I was studying sports science, um, exercise physiology, and there were some people who were academically so intelligent. You put them in a gym and they didn't know what a flipping barbell was. I was yeah. like, how are you going to help anyone? Yeah. You have to have practical experience with this. And then it comes back to, do you really have the results? Like, can you help people get the outcome that they're looking for? You may be able to talk about it, but it's a very different thing navigating with people. And that's where tying back into coaching for yourself you said two th- like year 2000 was when you first started going I need to start heavily investing in coaching why did you see that was a necessary part of you creating a better outcome or more success um, I think I kn- <coughs> I'd, I'd made it to where I was by myself just without grunt work just doing absolute grunt work um, burning myself out neglecting my relationship with my wife um yeah just 
working way too much and then I, I knew that there had to be a smarter way to do things um so probably one of the the biggest takeaways that I've got out of my coaching early days was my communication was just horrible um and that that was with my wife and my communication wasn't great with my employees either I was sort of had my head down and I was going as fast as I could in in the direction that I was pointing but I wasn't really coaching my staff or showing them how to do things or bringing them along with me Mm. I was just trying to get from A to B as quick as I could Um, and yeah learning to slow down and use a calendar and block time out for certain things um, was really where my coaching coaching started Um, and then through through that um, I, I yeah really started to find some gaps and problems within what I was doing and just um, keep plugging them one by one. So it's not a not a race and I th- like yeah striving for excellence is a word I've been using within the office lately. Where yeah we all get flustered and we all get the shits every now and then and we yep. think we're bloody useless at what we're doing. But then you don't have to look very far to realise how bloody well we're going as a as a team within the business. So yep. I every time when like we just did a, a way job recently and a couple of the boys got pretty frustrated because we stuffed up some of the ordering and gear wasn't arriving and then, you know, they're trying to get the job done as, as efficiently as possible and they're chasing around for material. So they were getting a bit frustrated and everything and I was I just said to them boys like we're we're doing well you guys are doing well we missed a few things and this is how we're going to fix it moving Mm. forward it's no point us carrying on about it now because it's done and dusted and i was sitting right here yesterday with those those guys um along with tash my general manager and we just had a chat for like 10 or 15 minutes the boys left not being frustrated (laughs) they know that we're um trying to to rectify some of the issues through process and I said to the guys look we're doing everything so well but we can do a few things a little bit better yep. so I think we we get tangled up in the negatives um, and I think that's just human nature where you, you get flustered tangled up in the negatives and you forget to look at the <coughs> at the positives and yep. I, I often talk to um, some of my staff about gratitude and, um, look, I haven't been great myself at at journaling and doing my, my daily deposits on the gratitude stuff, but I know that when I'm sliding in that miserable direction that it only takes me five minutes of writing things down and I can put everything back into perspective and then I'm, then I'm sweet again, so... I've got the tools there to be able to do it. I probably should do it a bit more often. Yep. But, yeah, I think that's been a um, another great takeaway from something yeah, you've taught me over the years. The old pen and paper, mate. You can't beat it. Let's uh, change the direction of it a little bit just to, before we wrap it up. One question that a lot of like men want to know about this is fatherhood and business, almost like that work-life balance. So... Um, you've got your daughter and you've got Louie as well. You manage a big company, high stress. You also make time for gym, uh, date days. I know you've got, we've got a special day tomorrow, which will be awesome. How has becoming a father changed your outlook on business and shifted priorities? Yeah, so, yeah, well, when Maddie was born, um, I was in a bit of turmoil at that point with the business uh things weren't going great I'd lost a big contract and basically had to work like a dog to to get out of it um I'm glad I did uh so I don't ever want to be back in that position so I think uh communication with my wife and prioritizing <coughs> um time with the kids has been super important so like I used the sports day uh, comment before, but that let's just use that as an analogy. Um, obviously, there's only one sports day a year. So it's not, <laughs> yeah. Not, yeah, you're just giving yourself the one day. Yeah, yeah. It's not about the three hours that I want to get off out of the whole year. 
Um, it's about being able to do school drop-offs, do kindy pickups, do, um, you know, if if my wife needs a hand or whatever, I'm yep. able to do that. Um, and that just comes down to us managing our our time together. So I think I, I was just listening to the, the Matty Lank podcast and yep. he was saying how he's, you know, prioritise the morning now with his kids because that's what his wife needs at this point in time. Yep. Um, and my wife's just gone back to work Thursdays and Fridays. So I basically make sure I don't have anything on before nine o'clock on, yep. on Thursdays and Fridays now because I'll do the daycare drop off for Louie and then I'll, I'll do the um, school drop off for Maddie and, you know, Five years ago, that just wouldn't have been a reality. I would have been on a roof somewhere. So yep. um, I suppose um, being able to yeah, manage your time, and I, I know everyone can't do this in a nine-to-five job, but yeah, being able to manage your, your time in a way that supports your family life as well has been super important to me. It's something to consider. It's something that I thought about in 2014 was like, how do I want to be as if I ever become a dad or in those certain roles, what do I need to have in my life? That's why I work for myself because it is a bit more challenging uh, in the, the nine to five role. For example, you don't have as much flexibility, pros and cons to both, um, which is why I've done certain things much like yourself. But it's not about just waking up one day, which is what I think a lot of people do. They wake up and they've just had their first kid and they're like, fuck. I want to be there. I want to be a present dad. I want to be able to do, you know, school drop-offs and all of that, but yeah. I just don't have the time. I'm not allowed the flexibility or I can't take time away from work. And that's why I think anyone who's listening to this show anyway would be a growth-minded individual who is trying to get their ducks in a row for certain stages of their life. Yeah. Why is it so important for you that you are able to help your wife? Why is it so important for you that you are able to do those things with your kids? It's important to me because... Obviously, you need that connection time with your children. You don't like you don't want to be getting home from work, seeing them for fifteen minutes, and then they're going to bed. So, having that time in the morning when they're generally happy and you know it's it's good fun in the morning. So, yep. I find that's a, a great time to spend with them because you don't want to be just in that routine of just doing you know dinner, bed, bath, done sort of thing. It's just yep. like you're just hitting like three chores in a row with them and it and it can get monotonous for them and for you so being able to separate out some other time to spend with them has been super important um and i had something else i was going to go with before oh so with the nine to five thing with being stuck in a nine to five or whatever whatever it is and people not being able to spend time with their kids not everyone can just change their job or whatever yep. but what i do within my business like lee my operations manager he, he starts at like 5 a.m on monday tuesday and wednesday and then but he's out of here at two o'clock and yep. then he does school pickup because his wife works afternoon yep. work so he does school pickup and then he's got the kids um in the afternoon and he also makes time for um, jiu-jitsu in the morning <laughs> awesome. as well so he just altered his hours to suit what he needed in his life and I allow him to do that because I value him within my business so if you're in a position where your your boss doesn't value you enough to be able to change your hours to suit your lifestyle I'd say get another job mm. so um, <coughs> and then on Thursdays and Fridays, uh, his wife doesn't work that afternoon uh, shift that she does on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. So then he changes his hours up and he might do start a bit later and he finishes a bit, bit later. Yep. So I think there's always a way out of it if, or there's always a way to improve your lifestyle if you're doing the right things as an employee and you're valued to the business. And if you think you're valued and the and your boss doesn't value you, then I'd probably move on. Yeah. It's obviously situational depending on whether you've got bills and stuff to pay, but it's the same thing. If you want 
that desired outcome and you're clear on how you want to be showing up in relationships with your health, all of those sorts of things, and how you need to structure your day, you've got to make some tough decisions to set your life up for that, which is hard. Yeah. However, it's better than having a fucking miserable life, like one where you don't get to see your kids grow up and they're 18 and they don't even want to have a beer with you, Yeah, like, which is what some people experience. Or you, you, know, you get to 55 and you're getting close to retirement and you can't enjoy retirement because you're 40 kilos overweight, your missus hates you because you haven't invested in the relationship, you haven't invested in your health. That's why, and especially today's world, there's a lot more focus and emphasis on work-life balance as such, whatever that looks like for the individual. Yeah. But, you know, you need to know what you want and how that looks and then have those conversations and work out compromises and maybe even go to your employer and say, hey, if I do this, I feel like potentially my productivity is going to be better because I'm going to come in feeling fulfilled that I got to see my kids. I'm not coming to work on shit. I never see my kids growing up and I'm thinking yeah. about that 70% of the time. A lot of things to consider. Yeah, and that's right. And I think if any any <coughs> employer isn't flexible to to someone's needs, then either they're a shit employee, you're a shit employee and they don't want to bend to suit you and they don't really care what the outcome is mm -hmm. or they're an asshole and it's, probably time to to look elsewhere so that's some of the gardell love right there <laughs> <laughs> just straight up yeah well look you're not you're not going to bend over backwards for someone who you don't feel um, it's feel valued by yeah or if you've got an employer that you know takes the piss a bit and they're kind of just a number filler mm -hmm. if they come to you with a, a request or something or they want to change their hours or whatever and you kind of could take it or leave it with them, yep. then you're probably not going to be very flexible towards them. But yep. if you're a valued uh, employee and you're, and you're doing the right things, then I can't see why anybody wouldn't be flexible to the needs. Mm. And I think we are definitely seeing more of that as a, as a bit of a cultural shift since the COVID work from home stuff yep. and, and things like that. But I just can't think of anything worse than being people being in a position where they're just like chained to their job as an employee this is and you know they might be on a 40 hour salary and they're doing 60 hours a week it's just i just can't stand that corporate slavery mm. thing and I, I i actually tell my employees to go home a lot of the time when they've had when i know they've had enough yep. like and they'll push and when it's on it's on sort of thing but like a lot of the a lot of the guys yesterday just took off at like lunchtime because we'd had a pretty big week and yep. I was just like yeah right let's just wrap it up eh <laughs> so I need to come work for you <laughs> <laughs> It'd be the way to do it mate where can people so where do you service from solar like what what's your I'm not going to just say Brisbane because I know you're all over but for anyone listening who wants to get some solar or electrical work Gardel Electrical yeah so where can people hit you. We don't just do solar, but that is predominantly what ends up well, happening. You, but you are solar, Sam. That's right. Energy efficiency solutions is what we like to say. Um, and, yeah, so we basically cover all of Queensland and northern New South Wales. Um, we do a lot of remote remote work, so out um, Roma, Gundy, St George, Kunnamulla, Everywhere. Kai, Gladstone, Rockhampton. Yeah, we're sort of scattered all over the place um and we sort of we've got a couple of crews that do 10 day swings out that way yep. um and yeah we can basically service all of queensland and they just head to gardell electrical.com that's it gardell nailed it .com .au. Thank or, you. or au and you can also see solar sam on instagram i reckon you need to change your handle or um, maybe i could do that I can be a game trend. <laughs> Gardell Electrical on, on yeah, Facebook or Instagram suite as well. Awesome. Thanks for coming on, mate. Been Thank a pleasure. You. Don't Cheers. move too fast. <laughs>